hello Annabelle and Cam and thank you for coming back for um, for our third interview with New Zealand Film Commission and New Zealand On Air. Um, I think let's start with um, what's happened over the past week. Um, Annabelle, can you just cover off um, Boost and um, how, where you are with that and your amendments to the um, grant guidelines and any news on the rescue package? Sure. So the Boost itself will be launched um, up on the portal later today so that people can start applying from end of day today with the applications due on the 4th of May, Monday the 4th of May. What we want to do is turn that around as quickly as possible. So we're hoping to have results in the week of the 20th of May, subject to the number of applications, of course. So, you know, there may be a lot of applications that just makes that processing a little bit um, harder to do, but our intention and target is the week of May 20th for a result. We know that everyone will have worked hard to get them in by um, the 4th of May, because we're only giving people just over two weeks, um, and that's in the interest of expediently getting these funds out the door. Mm, great. Oh, speak, you want to ask too, yeah. Yeah, the the, um, the grant amendments, New Zealand grant amendments. Yeah, so the screen production grant, we're, we're um, continuing to interact with um, the Ministry of Culture and Heritage, um, which is oversees, as it were, the, the rules on the grant. And so they've been, we've taken um, feedback from Sparta, we've taken on feedback from um, individual producers uh, regarding what people would like to see uh, the, in changes for this big. And those are being, have been written up as technical criteria. You have to sort of legalistically go through the criteria and propose those changes. And um, we've, we've talked them through also with Cam and his team um, in case there are ways in which we can all partner on these things. And so, yep, yeah, those changes have gone back and forth to the Ministry of Culture. And we're, you, they have to be turned into a significant paper, of course. Uh, and but that's the process we're in. What's the timing for for all of that? Is it sort of weeks, or or are you thinking months? I'm hoping um, that it will be within weeks that we can get that answer. Um, but I'm just mindful that I, it's what's been happening with Ministry of Culture is they're working on many many fronts, including the, the rescue package. So in parallel, we're doing a lot of work in parallel which I don't have a specific answer as to how quickly we can get it turned around. The thing will be is, you know, is it something can be done ministry-wise or does it need to be done through the cabinet, um, et cetera. Okay. And Cam, can you cover off any updates from at New Zealand On Air? Uh, sure. Um, afternoon all. Um, thank you for having us back. Um, yeah, look, I guess the big, the, the sort of the big initiative that we were talking about last week or the week before was our sort of rapid response RFP. Um, we'd set aside um, 400k for just fun ideas from various kind of people to, to, to try and get, you know, people in work and get some content up onto, onto our platforms. Um, we had 112 applications seeking over five and a half million dollars. So um, uh, obviously a double-edged sword in terms of um, just so oversubscribed it wasn't funny but some amazing amazing ideas obviously we managed to fund a bunch we, we couldn't fund anywhere near all of them um, but we did manage to increase our funding from 400 up to 700 uh, which has kind of meant that we've got um, about nine I think nine really interesting um, projects up and running in fact I think one starts shooting tomorrow so um, I guess from our perspective that's a real success um, to those that weren't successful we're, we're obviously sorry but we've received some great feedback from the industry um, just around how quickly we sort of moved and freed up some money to try and help. Um, just sort of further to um, Annabelle's point around the cultural recovery package uh, we continue to work with MCH as well. Um, the truth of the matter is uh, you know, there's a little, there's a, there's obviously a lot of other packages that are being sort of processed through, um, and I, even though I think cabinets meeting daily, um, there's just so much work that's going on there um, where we sort of haven't really been given any kind of idea about timing. I think we were hoping that there might be some sort of announcement around a package within the next week or so. Um, but obviously there's, you know, there's constant changes. Um, the one thing I will talk to as well, I guess, is um, again, Annabelle and I, I think are pretty aligned on this. We, we are aware that um, productions are gonna be impacted 
by by COVID, not just those that have had to pause. Obviously, we've talked about that before. So we know that th those productions that have had to pause that need to get back up are going to have some 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 cost implications. But actually, uh, it's not just that. It's it's the new world that we may have to embrace for quite some time yet. It's sort of alert level two, for instance, which. Uh, is, is likely to require, you know, additional cost, whether it be for crew or safety gear or testing or various other things. So, um, again, we're trying to feed feed information through to MCH about what that looks like. Um, and and again, I'll say the more information we can get around um, around that, the better. Um, uh, again, I think we have a great relationship with with Sparta. I think that's obviously a, a, a pretty sort of simple forum to funnel that information through to. Obviously, you can funnel it through to us as well. Um, and it's worth mentioning the Ministry of Culture and Ministry of Business um, reps are attending the COVID industry weekly meetings to hear about these kinds of issues. So they're very aware both from us and from the industry members of that group about the costs to get a project back up and running. And, and obviously the guilds are involved in that as well, so I'm sure they're hearing back, but um, obviously Annabelle and I were on a call this morning with that group, and uh, the work that is going into that whole health and safety piece is really, really impressive and significant, um, uh, which is fantastic, because I think it's, it's, it's the industry helping the industry, right? It's actually about trying to work out how we can get back to work safely as quickly as we can. Do you, do you have a sense from government, um, because obviously in, you know, in light of the announcement yesterday about what level three would mean. Mm. Um, I think, yeah, there's a degree of uncertainty amongst producers at what, and it will depend on, it will depend on the nature of their project, whether it be you know, a small documentary or a large drama, at what stage they will be able to start production up again. Have you had any guidance from government, you know, what the levels mean in, you know, in, for, the, for the screen industry? You know, is there any chance that productions may be able to get back up under level three? Or will it be a case that we do all have to wait till level two? Um, well, we, as Annabelle just said, we actually had um, we had MCH and MB um, officials on the call this morning, um, and there was a little bit of a talk around some sort of certification or accreditation to allow productions to commence. I think it was made pretty clear to the group that actually that's not really what the government are going to require. I think it's it's going to be industry. Um, taking on sort of its own responsibilities around this. Um, one interesting thing I think was that um, Kelly Lucas mentioned that the construction sector lead from WorkSafe was involved in, in conversations they were having and, and the construction sector kind of health and safety sort of return to work program is, is a sort of a starting point. So I think what would be smart is for us as a sector to kind of have a look at some other similar type industries and, and get a sense about how that's happening as well. Yep, just to touch on that, Cam, the COVID-19 group that's been set up, as you know, which you're part of this morning, is yep. doing a lot of work on that toolkit. And one of the documents that they're looking at is apparently there's an eight page document for the construction industry which has you know, been worked up amongst the industry and with government, I mean, that's you know, potentially a, a useful template for the screen industry to, to use. Good starting point. Yeah. Um, it's just, yeah, obviously it's very hard. Yeah, from a public perspective, even to know what level three means, it's, yeah, it's very hard from a production, even harder from a production perspective to work out what that's going to mean. Annabelle, you're on mute. Hmm. My sound is playing up. Can you hear me now? Um, so, um, yeah, the if I'm repeating anything because I missed some of the sound there, um, the WorkSafe, we're, we're interacting with WorkSafe um, to understand how their system is going to work. Because if you look at Alert Level 3, for example, it talks about the the notion of oversight from um, the government in terms of an approved safety approach to um, to different businesses getting back to work. And so I think we want to really understand through interaction with government entities around what would be approvable, certifiable for businesses to get back to work. And um, that's playing a role in the, the work we're doing with the Screen Guild um, for this toolkit. So, yeah. Fantastic. Um, can we can we talk about the screen sector strategy to um, 2030? The re reaction that you've had to date and the various groups and and what's been done to um, to respond to this. 
Well, the screen sector strategy is um, its own process, obviously, um, with its, its leaders and its group doing that process. And I believe people will be responding by 24th of April through that system. So from as far as the Film Commission is concerned, we've been reading the document and um, working through what um, kinds of feedback we would um, provide to that group. And it's somewhat of an independent group, but made up of industry members. So uh, I think the issue will be um, under the current circumstances of COVID, um, does that, <clears throat> even though they've attempted to take that into account, um, <clears throat> you know, what might be the best first thing that we should all be focusing on at the moment. And, um, and I'm sure just working directly everyone should be working directly through that group um, to, to give that feedback and we're going to meet with industry um, generally as much as possible to find out how industry sees the, the, the strategy itself um, is, is probably where we're at. Okay, Cam, do you have any comments? Um, not much more to add than Annabelle, really. I mean, look, we've had, look, as you would imagine, um, I've been kind of talking to a number of um, industry um, players, particularly producers, um, just simply because I'm, you know, just trying to meet people. Um, and, and look, you know, what I'm, what I'm sensing is that there is not um, a huge amount of sort of alignment around um, views on, on the document. Um, it does seem like there are um, quite a few people that, um, have some issues with with, with um, parts of the recommendation. I, I think just picking up on Annabelle's point, I think the important thing here is to make sure that the feedback is is provided through the group. Uh, I I, I, pr I can only presume that they've asked for feedback for a reason. So so let's mm -hmm. hope that that feedback is is taken um, and and listened to. Yeah, and it's it's this um, was always going to be and needs to be a good opportunity to speak to the ministry about what the industry sees needs to be done so some really granular action plans are really helpful in this kind of situation so um, you know we we'd like to ensure that that we can work with the group to um, if there were some of their elements that can get some more granularity before the final uh, version that that would be really helpful hmm. Um, Annabelle, there was an article in the Herald um, this week about lotto revenue, that it's down to 54% um, of the tickets that, were, um, that would normally be um, sold at the comparative jackpot levels. Um, just wondering if you've had any update from um, lotto and what your, you know, any predictions of what's coming up. Your sound's not working again. You sort of have to, anyway, apologies. So <laughs> yeah, we were aware that um, the that generally 75% of lotteries purchases come with physical um, kind of purchasing uh, when we went into alert four. And so we'd been analyzing and um, sort of estimating what might what that might result in. So it is in line with what we expected that there would be that drop and, and both through our own estimates and our discussions with lotteries. So we made our changes and adjustments to our budget for this financial year based on those estimates. Um, the thing is, things will change again though. So um, what we um, think will happen with, is that potentially, of course, we move to, I think it's not in until alert level two again, that you get those physical shopping opportunities for lotteries and, and therefore the chance for that side of the business to recover. Um, but once that happens, then, you know, that will be obviously a change to the fortunes ahead. And also the fact that there is going to be probably a lot more online um, uh, kind of using of, the, of that product. Because as I mentioned last week, uh, yeah, there's pretty high levels of New Zealanders using online gambling and they may move to the Lotto brand more um, in these times. You never know. <laughs> okay. Now, we've got quite a, few, uh, quite a few questions from the industry this week. So um, I'll start off with the, the first one. 7,000 film workers are out of work. All the New Zealand Film Commission staff remained fully employed. And I guess that goes for New Zealand on air as well presumably on 100% of their salaries. But the Inwards Incentive Division can't do anything um, because as the government says, no one comes in until we have a successful vaccine. 
Um, so there's nothing that can keep them busy. Training can't do anything. Will the New Zealand Film Commission share the industry pain and stand down employees? So first up, the New Zealand Film Commission staff are, are working as ever, hard as ever, on the normal projects that they run. And as you know, apart from the new boost funds, there's three quarters of a million dollars worth of other funds that need to get out the door by June 30. So, and then staff across the organisation are working on issues associated with COVID. So um, that's, that's a really important consideration. The other issue to be aware of is that the incentives team looks after both international and national SPIG. There's active projects, um, more than 30 in each case, where, um, where there's provisional and final certificates that need to be considered and still being worked on. When you look at the international attractions team, which I, I think is what you might be referring to in that inbound concept. Um, so the international attractions team is a very small team, but um, they are working closely with physical production heads internationally to both understand how they are working, how are they planning to get started up again? What are the systems and protocols they will use? It's our international team that's working with and funding the toolkit with the guilds and working regarding work safe and immigration on um, issues around um, how do you get key cast into the country, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of aspects to the work that continues to be done. Um, uh, we've got multiple uh, co-production treaties in play and being considered. There's a lot of action in terms of um, the international marketplace, in terms of financiers um, and sales agents, virtual markets, virtual festivals, and the usual festival work going on for, for Toronto and Venice. And still, as we, sh as we know, um, one aspect of Cannes is not confirmed yet. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot of work going on. Um, the other issue is that we, the Film Commission, are subject to um, employment legislation as well. So, you know, there's, there's methodologies and processes that are part of all these things. It's, it's early days in this process, but I can assure everyone how hard New Zealand Film Commission team are working with business as usual in so many areas and where there needs to be new pivots towards the future to get ready for the future. Um, staff are working on those as well. Mm. And Cam, have you, are you facing any pressure to, um, to stand down employees or take, you know, have reductions? Um, we're, I mean, we're pr pretty lean, uh, I'm sure Annabelle's the, the same. Uh, and we, you know, we're, I mean, just in terms of our, our ability to work remotely, we are doing that really well. I'm, I'm blown away by just the amount of work that, that you know, my team's getting through, to be honest. And, and, and look, anyone that's working remotely is finding that difficult. But um, we, we had our funding team go, effectively are working on two funding rounds at the same time. So they, they managed to get through the rapid response RFP and um, we've got a, a formal meeting on Monday as a team to, to go through the, the current funding round. We've got another funding round coming up. Um, guidelines should be out for that um, uh, later next week. Uh, obviously, we've also got a, a, a small, perfectly formed um, music funding team that uh, have just kind of completed their round as well. So they're really, I mean, there's not really a lot of room for us to, 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 to reduce cost. Um, the the 20% salary um, decrease that was announced yesterday for state sector CEOs is, is highly likely to um, um, be applied to Annabelle and myself. Um, SSC have been in touch with, with me in relation to that. They're just working through the processes of that. So I guess that's, that's some, some small example of us um, sharing in the pain. Um, Welcome to your new job, Ken. <laughs> Yeah, the State Service Commissioner wrote to us and just talked about how a lot of these things have to be worked through. The, Re the Remuneration Act itself has to be dealt with in relation to even the ministerial uh, wages changes, etc. So it's not like a simple thing that occurs, um, but yet there's, we're going to be advised. Um, they're still looking at the processes and we're going to, we're, you know, we await their guidance. In, in a broader question and sort of similar vein, there's been um, talk about among some producers and this is obviously more direct to the Film Commission because NZ On Air clearly has a very, yeah, all, all sort of entirely domestic focus. Mm -hmm. Will there be a shift uh, away from some of the international um, work that you've been doing to focus more of your funding and attention on entirely on domestic? I mean, I think the key issue is that we still need to finance 
um, good quality drama in New Zealand and it is hard to, to fund it totally out of government funds, let alone because of the criteria, but even just in terms to make that dollar go as far as it can. So to the extent that producers can still connect with the international marketplace, particularly at a time where if New Zealand does crush the curve, as it were, and get back to production as soon as possible, our content may have an opportunity that is really worth pursuing. And so that's why we're placing so much importance on maintaining and building those relationships with um, sales agents and financiers and other partners overseas. So um, we're using our international contacts, contacts through um, physical production to also increase our um, creative commissioner type contacts. Um, so I think an international focus for New Zealand is as important as ever in order to make, for, for producers to make their way through this. Um, it's always been something that you must do at the same time as valuing New Zealand content, you know, purely New Zealand for New Zealand. But I think uh, the fact that New Zealand producers have always been able to produce some good global content, they should keep doing that. And then mm. that raises a question around immigration, because obviously a lot of that international finance is driven by um, an international element to the production, particularly around cast. Um, and I know that the COVID-19 group is having conversations around you know, immigration and when um, you know, personnel might be allowed in and whether there might be exemptions. Are there concerns that, you know, the, the, in this dismiss, domestic focus again, that we should be prioritizing domestic because it's gonna be a smaller numbers where it might be one or two people to bring in for a essentially domestic project where the bigger international productions will be requiring very large numbers to come in. Um, and that might muddy the waters for trying to get a few exemptions through. Well, it's, it's an interesting concept of a strategy. I, I appreciate that. I think the thing is though, that many productions, many international productions are over 90% crewed by um, New Zealanders. Uh, in some cases, 95% plus. Um, so, you know, in terms of the numbers of internationals that are brought through, um, it's still not a huge number when you consider um, how many New Zealanders are getting work on some of those projects. But yeah, I think it is important for us to, to talk this through with immigration. Uh, are they considering any kind of selective uh, approvals for particular businesses? And that's the question that we're um, in the process of, you know, finding an answer to so that we can know. And we know there's huge economic value to New Zealand productions that, um, would have higher end cast and would want to have those cast able to um, to be in the country. And there's certain even medium and low budget New Zealand films that have one Australian or one English person and their financing that they got prior to COVID was subject to that cast. We want those films to still get made and, um, and we are really um, focused on uh, making sure that we can all understand and activate the, the commitment from immigration to assist in this too. Because presumably that's a very important way when your, your funds are stretched and will be increasingly stretched of leveraging those funds that any international money that can be brought in is stretching mm -hmm. your funds further. Yeah, and the more production we can get, the better. Um, and that does mean that we will need um, some international funds and people uh, have proven themselves to be good at getting international funds. And, you know, there's still a, a really strong appetite out there for content amongst the international, you know, long-standing international partners to New Zealand and new partners. Um, you know, as you know, New Zealand Film Commission has a seat at the IDFA table and talks with all those um, sales agents and distributors. Um, about what they're looking for, what do they need, what are they going to do to respond to COVID, and they're very bullish about getting on with new content. Great. Our next question, why doesn't the New Zealand Film Commission reduce the grants to guilds by 20%? All commercial enterprises are facing these decisions, decisions and sharing the burden. These two moves would enable more, or th this move would enable more, more money for filmmakers Annabelle, what do you think? Or oh, actually, Richard, do you want to um, do you want to um, sort of talk about how sort of I mean how Sparta would be affected, given we're pretty streamlined? Um, yeah, I mean, as as many of you know, yeah, Sparta only has one full time employee, being Sandy, and then there's two two part timers. Um, 
yeah, I, I completely can understand the logic in terms of of when everyone's experiencing pain, yeah, and taking cuts, why that shouldn't be shared. But I think there's also a counter argument to consider that the guilds at these time these at this time are incredibly important because yeah, there's sort of a policy storm going on at the moment in mm -hmm. terms around the cultural recovery package and and yeah, these issues that we've been talking about around immigration and health and safety. And you need your guilds to to you know to help formulate that policy because they have the relationships with the agencies and the relationships with government and the policy experience. Where I think there's a danger if we're if we're you know trying to uh, get savings in those guilds, which tend to run on a very lean budget anyway, that their ability to deliver on their work will be compromised, and that's actually going to make it even more challenging for the likes of New Zealand Film Commission and Enzo Nair because there's a certain advantage for them, which I'm sure Cam and Annabelle can talk to, of dealing with a handful of guilds versus having to deal with numerous individual producers. So I completely understand the logic and I think, you know, um, I'm sure all the guilds, and I know we are at Sparta, are trying to find cost efficiencies because our income is down overall anyway, particularly mm -hmm. in respect to Sparta because we yeah, the largest part of our income is is production levies, which obviously we're not receiving at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, our membership is actually going up, uh, which I think is indicative of the fact that people need the guilds. But um, I, I think potentially taking that cut would be counterproductive. Mm. Yeah, I mean, this is a time to support the guilds. I actually think the sign of a, of a significantly mature sector uh, and a mature industry is strong guilds. And also, um, we, we have actual contractual arrangements with guilds regarding um, the payment structure for, for their work and what they do. So it's not like you can change that contractual arrangement. Uh, but I, I agree with Richard too, these are very small, um, they're very lean entities um, doing as much work as possible to, to kind of support um, their members. And um, they're probably doing more work than ever before in the committees they're doing, as you say, in the policy storm of COVID, um, they're working pretty hard. I mean, that doesn't go away, that doesn't um, make it any better that there is so much uh, devastating unemployment in the screen industry at the moment and nobody shies away from that. Um, we, I think everybody takes their roles very seriously and feels really passionate about working for the industry to get it back up again and get people working again. Um, and there is no one um, uh, shirking from that responsibility. Absolutely understand where the idea comes from, but you know, there, it's it's um, it's the time to get the guilds uh, to have the guilds appreciated for the work they do on behalf of of their members with both government and with film commission with NZ on air. So yeah. Mm. Just um, if you want a small comment from me, I mean, I think the, the example I talked about just before, I think Kelly Lucas spoke really, really eloquently this morning at the COVID group. Um, she's taken the, <clears throat> the absolute lead um, from the perspective of the Tecos Guild in, in pulling together, uh, you know, the, the, the significant health and safety kind of mm. um, program that, that the industry is going to need. And you know, the, the, the difference between the industry being able to get, get up and running quickly and not um, is going to have a lot to do with that really fine work. So um, it is sort of a little bit like, hey, you, you're, you're, you're actually better off to continue to support the people that are doing the fine work that actually will benefit the industry um, mm. in a wider sense. Mm. Okay, next question again, sorry, Annabelle, you're being bombarded. Um, does the Film Commission believe that the criteria for allocation of the proposed boost schemes will actually generate any results? Surely the most efficient way to get results is to identify 10 companies that have demonstrated track records in getting projects up and support them with the criteria that they must apply gender, ethnicity, hiring policies. Well, I mean, I think as people will see when they see in the guidelines um, that there are um, three kinds of boost in a way, but there's boost, boost up, and there's also already out there how. Um, there's uh, 24 companies, 12 against each that will get funded. Um, I, I do understand the comment that that is put by that question and obviously would love to see um, the evidence around there, you know, because people have lots of views on what's the best path for the sector. Um, there's never going to be one view as to what 
is the best way to do it. The outcome would be, um, we are outcome focused, the, the structure of the, the grant uh, of the boost will be outcome focused and the way in which people pitch to get the funds will be outcome focused. We don't know how many applications and what the quality will be. We'll be, we'll be looking very, um, very strongly at the quality and the capacity for outcomes. Um, that will be a key issue in assessing them. So, um, you know, we, we believe that it's going to work the way we've described it um, and we will be looking to, to ensure that anyone who is successful has a significant way of achieving a, a, a true path to achieving the outcomes they propose. I think we should break it up and give Cam a question for a change. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cam, just going back to the um, cultural recovery package, there's been, and, and yeah, this is a long running debate, there's been a lot of talk and and I guess it's an ironic fact now that you know, Netflix and other international services like Amazon Prime, yeah, you know, their, their, their figures in New Zealand are rising, yet they don't directly contribute in any way to the New Zealand tax base or there's no quotas and things. And there's obviously been a lot of talk amongst the industry is why aren't we taxing them or why aren't there quotas? Um, are you able to explain, you know, sadly, why we aren't in a position to do that and how we're constrained by international law? Um, a little bit. Um, look, I guess the starting point for me is, look, um, what is what is amazing about this industry is that you've got a lot of people that uh, are creative and they're coming, coming up with as many ideas as you might think possible. And that, that's actually a good thing. Um, some of the ideas are more possible than others. And, and to be fair, Richard, there's been a number of other ideas that have been put forward by sort of media companies and things as well around sort of Google and Facebook. Um, similar sort of issues around taxation and, and, and government spend and all the rest of it. I mean, part, part of the obvious problem we have is that, um, you know, we're talking about international law here. So, so we're talking about um, GATT treaties that, 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 that are, are beyond just uh, New Zealand government making a decision, uh, even if they were, you know, inclined to. So, um, look, as I say, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to kind of say don't don't come up with ideas, but I think you're 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 quite right, Richard, and and sort of saying, look, there are some that simply are uh, that. What I can tell you is the sense I get from the current government is that they want to they want to find quick solutions. Um, they're aware that actually right now this is about triage. It's about finding sort of immediate ways to make make a change. Um, these ideas would take literally years, I would have thought, to kind of work through the international kind of yeah. um, system. So, um, look, it, it, I can understand why people would raise it, um, but, but I can't see it necessarily being something that could be turned around quickly. Yeah, I mean, to reinforce your point, Cam, apparently there was an exchange today on, on Facebook with Fran O'Sullivan, Fran O'Sullivan and Grant Robinson, and she, she posed the question, why, you know, why can't we just tax you know, the, the Facebooks, Netflix, et cetera. And, and Grant Robinson raised the fact that when France talked about introducing a digital services tax, the US immediately threatened them with sanctions. So, yeah, that's the environment we're living in. But in light of that, does that raise the question in terms of the cultural recovery package? Um, is, is, is it as simple as the fact that we, as an industry, need to go to the government for a lump sum figure? You know, the, it's... it's not coming up with a whole load of different mechanisms is actually we need a big chunk of money. Um, look, we've sort of we've sort of tried to do a little bit of both. I mean, it really, to be honest, it, it, this obviously we're living in unprecedented times. Um, so uh, you know, I think the the worry I have, and um, I think this is pretty obvious. I think we've talked about it before, is that every sector is is being impacted pretty much. Um, and and there are a lot of hands in the air and some very, very big numbers that are no doubt being sort of bandied around. So um, look, I think Annabelle and I are trying to kind of go at this from a number of perspectives. So one is yes, hey, look, actually it would be great if we could get a decent lump of stimulus money um, that could be immediately used to get a whole bunch of production activity up and running. So we've, we've, we've put that forward as an idea, but we've also sort of said, hey, but by the way, there's some other things over here. Um, you know, look, the, the, the increased cost of production means that we might need a lump more. Um, mm -hmm. the, the make good for, for production sort of pause, both for us and for, for the NZFC. That's another sort of separate piece. Um, Look, I think we're, I mean, we're certainly putting forward as many sort of ideas that, that we believe are reasonable as we can. Um, the, 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 
the, the, the issue is we're not quite sure um, what the size of the ask is, not, not only from other sectors, but even within the overall kind of MCH sector. Uh, because of course, you know, the ballet and the orchestra and, and you know, numerous other really vital kind of cultural institutions have been impacted and, and will continue to be impacted for possibly quite long, quite a lot longer than, than the production sector. Mm. Yeah, in terms of that, you'd almost need alert level zero for performing arts to get back up and running. So that's a really significant sector. Um, uh, with devastation so there's a lot of prioritizing and, and we're trying to work with that but be clear about what we need. Annabelle one question that's been raised you know in in a sort of similar vein and sort of trying to you know um, as a mechanism to make it easier for things to get in production is the suggestion that the the market uh, requirement on the SPIG be removed you know currently it's it's 10 percent for feature films and it's what 25 for television I think isn't it um, and there's a suggestion, particularly in terms of feature film, that that should be removed because distributors and sales agents won't be in a position to, to pay the level of money that they have in the past. Obviously, there won't be potentially an appetite from New Zealand private investors and that further also things could be complicated by the lack of, of access to international talent. Is that um, it's sort of two parts of the question? A, is, is, is that something in people's consideration and secondly um, are you experiencing as a commission in terms of the market a reduction and Sharon yeah you know, maybe we'll be able to answer this too a reduction uh, in the appetite for distributors paying advances uh, for sales agents paying advances distributors paying EMGs so, or do you think that actually conversely there might be an opportunity where for good projects you know companies will really want them because they'll need them to re kickstart their companies Sorry, a long-winded question. <laughs> yeah, look, I think um, we're aware that there are producers who would like us to ask that question, and we certainly are asking that question um, and, and testing that out with the ministry and talking it through. We don't know if that will be a successful part of the changes. It's, it's difficult for the government to picture the notion of something that, you know, is fully funded by government or, or you know, 98% funded by government. Um, because there always has been this need to, to prove the capacity to reach the market. Um, I'm understanding of a New Zealand producer having, a, you know, being pessimistic or lacking in confidence of their capacity to access international finance or international partners. I can, I can understand people feeling that way. I think we've got to work hard to build that confidence um, build it back up, build it afresh, um, to ensure that people really still try to be partnering with the international market. And I agree, though, that um, distribution will be really struggling. New Zealand or ANZ distributors will be struggling under these circumstances. And it is um, expected that we will see uh, drops there. But in that broader international industry, I think you've still got to have the confidence to move out there and seek th those um, supports and manage all the ups and downs of it. That's even saying that you've got to get back into the how do we get the cast here question. Um, but yeah, I, I, I hear the producers that say that we take that seriously. We respect that question. We are putting that question, discussing it um, you know, seriously with ministry, but we don't know for sure how, whether it will succeed. Mm. Interestingly, we're, we're not seeing a drop off just yet at, at Fulcrum in terms of um, d distributors and sales agents and their advances. We're not seeing any reductions, but I think it, it is early days. We've just, um, Screen Australia have a have funding round um, applications need to be in soon, and we've had two projects with um, quite significant gap um, involved um, with sales agents and the um, sales agents funding that gap as well so um which is interesting it seems like we're we're actually seeing a bit of market activity i would say hmm. um just going back to um and this is a, a question for both of you i guess and it's where we sort of sit amongst the other um sectors in new zealand is that um since we since the borders 
um, won't be relaxed for 12 months and, or until there's a vaccine. Um, where do we sit in terms of the film industry and the preference between like, tourism and education and what have you to actually, um, you know, to have some, pre like where, where do we sort of sit in preference um, for, you know, being able to, um, to get people to come in with immigration? That was very long-winded, sorry. Um, checking you can hear me. Yeah. Good. Um, look, I think that's the work that we're in the process of understanding now, um, working out what's the best way to understand if there can be any um, special priority put on the screen industry's need for certain um, foreign entities to enter the company country. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really important thing to, to find out. Um, obviously, the, when you look at the size of these industries, the size of the tourism industry is around about $47 billion. Can, you know, so that's a massive industry affected by this. Um, but I, I, I would say that, that, yeah, obviously it's going to struggle really hard with this um, at least 12 months. Uh, mm. yeah, and and it's, a, it's a less manageable set of people to bring into the country selectively. Yeah. Right. I think that's that's a key point, though, isn't it, Annabelle? I mean, I think tourism um, it, it has obviously been immediately hit and will be hit for quite some time while the borders are closed. Uh, what we don't have any sense of is whether there there will be a slight loosening of the borders. I mean, that that really is 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 a sixty four million dollar question, right? Um, and and to Annabelle's point, the great thing about our industry is you could see a scenario where it might only be a very small group of key key cast or a couple of key crews. So we're not talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. We're talking about sort of a few key key people. Um, but, but the other side of it, of course, is people are going to have to be prepared to get on a plane and want to actually come here. Um, and and again, if we, if we get out of this thing um, earlier than many others, then it may well be a country that people are quite, quite inclined to try and get to. Um, but look, in, t in terms of the sort of the level of support that that we might expect to get as an industry versus some of the others? Um, I think that's a really valid question. I, I don't know. I honestly don't. I mean, the, the good thing about our industry, of course, is that the Prime Minister is our main minister. Um, she's a little bit busy at the moment, um, but, um, you know, we have we have very, very good support to the very highest level uh, within this government for, for, you know, culture and heritage. So, um, you know, I, I definitely think we're being heard. It's just, uh, you know, we're being heard alongside a number of other industries as well. Yeah, I guess too, the a big advantage we have is, you know, if you bring in two actors, for example, uh, yeah, it, it, in you know, many cases, yeah, it's generating sort of $10 million worth of expenditure. It's yeah. very unlikely that two tourists are going to spend $5 million each in the country. <laughs> That's right. And also you're creating, you know, uh, particularly in terms of domestic production, a cultural product, which is then going out to the world and selling New Zealand. So, yeah, we, we have a unique selling point there, which the tourism and education <coughs> industries don't because they're relying on volume where we have that advantage of a small number can generate a lot. That's right. Mm. Um, turning to insurance and completion guarantors, and this is a, a question for both of you. Um, I guess, Cam, you're probably not so much for, for completion guarantors. <laughs> But do you think that insurers um, and completion guarantors are going to improve but approve budgets which are dependent on offshore personnel coming into the country? Could you just repeat the last part of your question, Karen? I'm mean, sorry, Sharon, because my computer just keeps randomly turning off the sound. <laughs> it's the um, talking about. Um, do you think insurers or completion guarantors or even sales agents are going to approve budgets which are dependent on offshore personnel coming in before that before the whole of New Zealand is really open? You know, I think it is a really complex uh, question. It's the big question that we've all been grappling with since March, uh, which is what is the situation to bond delivery on a film when insurance can no longer cover, cover for COVID? Um, and, and so um, we, we know that the bond cannot bond unless there is someone prepared to underwrite the risk. And... You know, some people are calling for screen agencies both here and overseas to be the ones to underwrite the risk um, that is created in these situations. 
and yet trying to put the figure on the risk? Is it just a two week pause? Is it that your lead actor actually has the kind of COVID that means they're not well again for six weeks? Um, is it, you know, there are so many ways in which um, this could affect a, a production that means in trying to assess the risk is, is difficult, but I think we're committed to do it. I think I'm aware that Sparta is working on getting some, running those scenarios, running those numbers. And, um, and we've got to work out um, as New Zealand Film Commission and to the extent that NZ on Air projects were using bonds, you know, or, or needed to, you know, and we're working with this same issue, how can we support that? Um, can there be a government-led scenario that underwrites some of these COVID problems? Not, you know, maybe that's one of the ways to do it, that there is a government kind of approach to insurance in relation to COVID, not just for the screen industry, maybe for events, et cetera, et cetera. So there's got to be a solution to that for sure in this larger budget, larger crew setting with um, high-end cast um, and even just any cast, because if, if your cast of any level um, is, is uh, infected, then it affects your capacity to keep shooting. Um, will, will you be looking at it on a case-by-case Basis, and this is, is, is probably as much, if not more, a question for Cam, because obviously the large scale dramas are much more problematic because the cost implications of a shutdown or, in worst case, abandonment are very significant. But on more containable you know, documentary features, for example, or you know, small factual, et cetera, where you know, you've got a small crew and you can actually practice social distancing, so arguably they might even be able to shoot under level three, you know, the would you look at case by case basis on that, that you know, potentially they could build in some suspension shutdown costs within their budget uh, and not have the insurance cover, but you would be comfortable enough for them to proceed because they've got a plan of how they can deal with it and how they can contain the costs? Yeah, I, th I think that's right, Richard. I think it would, it would have to be case by case. I mean, our, our assumption is obviously that um, health and safety is always a key component of any production. Um, and, you know, the, the key thing there would be to, to, to know that they can actually commence safely. Um, I mean, look, we've just funded a bunch of stuff for, 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 for shooting and lockdown. So, um, uh, but I, I, do, I, I do take your point. I think it would need to be case by case on the basis of the size and scale of the potential risk. Um, I, I, look, I, I'm possibly being sort of overly optimistic, but it sort of strikes me that the way that this, gov this government has handled this this crisis in such a brilliant manner that um, I think we're moving to, 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 to stages where we will be kind of moving out of four, possibly out of three relatively quickly. Um, so, you know, what, what I guess I would hope is that, you know, most, I think most productions are more going more gonna to be in the, in the alert level two than three. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, you're right. If there's some factual documentary style opportunities that could be shot in three, um, we'd, we'd be, you know, we'd be prepared to look at it. Mm, and that's what we're finding definitely with um, our Australian producers is that it is case by case basis. And um, some of, um, we've got animations that have COVID exclusions on their um, insurance that um, are contracting and starting production now. But there are, um, you know, there are, are, there is a document in place to cover, to cover what would happen under COVID-19 if, 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 you know, if, if the production was affected by any, any, in any way. And the broadcasters and the state agencies and what have you and ourselves are across all of that and just building in our own COVID clauses and also some, some extra room if, if production is delayed. It's, easy, it's much easier for, the, for animation and documentaries. We, we haven't really dealt with it yet on the um, drama yet. Um, we are starting to see insurance um, premiums going up. Um, Annabelle and Cam, is that something that you're starting to see? And, and, and I guess, you know, I guess the, the call will be on, you know, greater funding from New Zealand Film Commission and New Zealand on Air to cover these extra costs, really. Yeah, we've done some analysis of what might be additional. We haven't actually done the analysis of the insurance changes, but we're aware that they will change. Yeah, I think this is just a reiteration of the point we made earlier around the the implications of um, you know shooting safely within alert levels. Um, insurance is obviously another key key component of a budget that's going to increase. I mean, the the you know the obvious worry is that you know we all want money to be going into the pockets of of of, of people working, 
Um, and when you've got budgets increasing for, for, for some of these other reasons, it's, it's, it's a real shame, but, but it's a mm. fundamental truth, right? I mean, it's just, it's just going to be something we're going to need to deal with. Um, uh, what, what, I'm, yeah, what I'm hoping for, what Annabelle and I are both working really hard for, is that that's sort of an additional lump of money that we can kind of put to kind of um, to compensate. Otherwise, it's just got to come out of the baseline funds that we have, which means we fund less, which is yeah. not what anyone wants. Yeah. Okay. Um, in a broken economy, desperate for funds, and a reduced tax base with, bus with businesses gone and unemployment over 10%, does, do either of you think that the um, New Zealand um, screen production grant incentives will be in place in a year? Um, there is no indication that, that they won't be running in a year. Um, there is no discussion of that specifically um, with the Film Commission. Um, if, if someone believes someone is floating that idea around the place, there's always someone floating that idea around the place. Um, so, you know, that we, we have the support, uh, we've heard the support of the Prime Minister for the Screen Production Grant, both international and national, um, multiple times. Um, there's real confirmed support for that. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I can't speak for the possibility of someone floating the idea. I, I just think um, it's a really significant uh, trigger for the economy, a really important part of it. So, yeah. Mm. Cam, do you have an opinion on that? Um, oh, look, I mean, it's a really fair question, right? I mean, what is the, what is the new normal going to be? But I think Annabelle's right. I mean, the, the thing about the, thing about the way that... that um, that um, the incentive is structured is that it, bring, it brings in it brings in export dollars for the country mm -hmm. uh, in a pretty significant and efficient way. To Richard's point before, you know, this isn't a volume play; this is a quality play. So this is this is possibly one of the you know one of the best levers available right now to get can it kind of get the export business and export you know uh, money in. Um, so, you know, I, I guess my hope, and look, the conversations I've had with a couple of producers in the last sort of week or two is, um, you know, they're all kind of working towards a plan of hope, hopefully being able to, um, um, you know, get into pre relatively soon. Sorry, that's my son. Um, and, um, and sort of working towards sort of, you know, September, October, perhaps coming into summer. Um, I think we, yeah, I mean, look, we just have to, we have to cling on to that thing. <laughs> um, it's, you know, I, I, and I think Annabelle's right. I'm not getting any sense right now that the government is looking at taking things away. Um, it, it, on the contrary, I think they're, they're looking at stimulating as much as they can. Mm, that's great. Um, a question for you both about um, what sort of support you're getting from your respective boards. Are they being nimble and, and able to meet outside set board meetings and what have you? That our board has always been nimble. <laughs> they're very... <laughs> Even when Cam was on, um, very nimble, and they um, they often meet or consider requests outside of of um, board time, and they've we've already had a Zoom meeting, and we're about to have the the, the usual formal board meeting upcoming, and it'll be a video conference. Um, they're very supportive of what you know, to assist in getting things done, including most recently that we were able to um, get the boost uh, fund. Um, through that process as well with all of their support and goodwill so um, yeah they're you know they're incredibly supportive and aware of what a difficult time it is and how we need quick decisions sometimes uh, what you said yeah um, I've got a fantastic board I have to say um, we've had we've had an out-of-time board meeting uh, that was last week um, I'm kind of keeping them up to date with sort of an email sort of on a, on a relatively regular at least sort of once or twice a week basis um, and yeah I mean look what I look a, a quote I got from one of my board members was listen you know we know how quickly everything is moving we support everything that you're doing um, we're here for you as you need us, but you know, also don't expect we don't expect you to be sort of writing long, lengthy papers because actually we want you to be doing the good things that, that you're doing. So uh, it's a good question, and it's actually quite nice for us to be able to sort of publicly say that uh, you know the support from our boards uh, through through this time is is as the industry would expect is is really really good. 
That's fantastic. And how, uh, how are your staff coping working remotely um, and what sort of um, level of industry interface, interface are they having at the moment compared to sort of pre-COVID? Are they having to field a lot, of, a lot more queries and, you know, is that having any, um, any effect on, the, on, the, on processes sort of naturally slowing down or, or how, how are they finding it? Yeah, I, I think everybody is, I think any of us that are working from home know that you, one seems to be constantly at the computer in a meeting or, or writing material. There's very little let up uh, at, during the day for that. So the staff are, are delivering uh, everything on time and, as, and yet, you know, as as far as the processes that I'm across. And um, I know they're talking to a lot of industry in different ways, depending on what, what groups they're in or what um, projects they're dealing with. You know, we had something like um, 28 projects that were in process at the time of the shutdown. You know, there has to be work done with all of those producers, et cetera. So there'd be different levels of need for those producers to talk to everybody. Lots of interaction with um, the, you know, uh, emerging and um, mid-career um, key people that talk to the that are working with talent department more often yeah so there's a lot of action okay Cam what about your staff uh, yeah I mean pretty pretty similar to Annabelle to be honest um, we we have we're very really we're really well set up for remote working actually we we made a couple of decisions but uh, before my time so I don't take any credit but but actually not that long ago to kind of um, set up a whole bunch of sort of shared shared systems that, that we can all plug into and, and in sort of in real time kind of engage and things. So um, we're, we're, I mean, to be honest, I think we, I mean, your point is a good one, Sharon. Are, are we more busy? Definitely. Because actually we're trying to keep all of the things that we normally do on track. Um, and, and then we've obviously kind of put a few other new things out there. And of course, as you would expect, Annabelle and I are sort of spending a lot of time engaging with the ministry and with ministers and, and various other sector groups and things like that. So. Um, but it's, you know, I, I keep on, I keep on saying it. I mean, my, my staff are incredible. Um, they really just, they, they, they do their jobs really well. They're really, really efficient. I mean, this is hard, right? This is really hard. I mean, everyone is finding the, the sort of the isolation difficult. We've got, um, you know, we've got some younger staff that are sort of in flatting environments. Um, um, you know, some, some that don't have, um, yeah. you know as great a setup as they might normally you know at work but um everyone's just kind of kind of getting on with it which is great that's brilliant and i've got one last question this is for you cam um will new zealand on air's funding continue to be for projects that are heavily localized or will it become more flexible um well obviously new zealand on air is all about local so um you know every project must be about local um that's that's a, sort of a non-negotiable really um i think what that might be kind of asking is is there any is there any sort of way that some parts of a project might not be completed sort of locally um I mean, look. Generally speaking, our preference, our strong preference, is for for activity to be done in this country right now more than ever. ever. I think that that should sort of be should should sort of continue to be the mantra. Um, but but I think what you're sort of hearing from Annabelle and I over the last kind of two or three weeks is that we're 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 open to be approached by people. You know, I mean, if there's if there's some if there's some reason why something needs to be sort of looked at in a different way. Um, we're happy to look at it. Fantastic. Richard, do you have anything else? No, I haven't got anything else. I guess it's, you know, Cam or Annabelle, is there any you know, messages you've, you'd like to get out to the industry or um, yeah, anything that you need for the industry or want to share with them? Just, um, you know, really wishing everyone to stay well and stay safe and also um, please work with, with Sparta, with your um, other guilds to ensure that we get to know what's going on, please contact our, our COVID email address. If you've got specific COVID staff, contact me, uh, et cetera, and our staff related to projects and questions. We want to make everybody, you, you know, we want everyone restarted as soon as possible. Yeah. Well said. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. And Thanks, have a good weekend, and we will uh, speak to you next week. Thanks, Thanks all. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.